Our next presenter is Yasemin Rizai. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Yasemin. Yasemin is a social media scholar, actor, and Instagram micro-influencer based in Miami, blogging about language and culture mostly for Persian speakers. Working at the intersection of new media studies and performance studies, and as a former engineer, her research is focused on social media, hashtag me too, and Insta poetry by employing digital humanities tools. She is the co-founder of instasociety.org, an open access resource exploring how social media is changing popular culture. She is a teaching assistant at University of Miami, teaching French, Italian, and Persian language, and currently works at the Center for Humanities, sorry, the Center for Humanities in the University of Miami as a UGRO fellow. Thank you so much, Yasemin. Sorry, I just couldn't unmute myself. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you, Erin, for your beautiful work uh, as a um, French, um, you know, like uh, instructor. I'll definitely have to employ your methods. They were just like wonderful. Yeah, you, you'll be my email. You'll see my emails in your inbox. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, folks, and just please let me know if you can um, see my screen. Perfect. Okay. So here's a work in progress, and I'm so happy that my colleague is here in the audience too. It's a, it's a collaborative project between University of Miami and University of Maryland with my colleague, Dr. Um, Mehdi Sadat Pana. And um, so um, for everybody, this is uh, Yasamin, a PhD candidate at University of Miami. And um, so we are, as, as also Sean said, I'm, my research is focused where performance studies and new media studies meet. And um, I'm, I'm very glad to give you a brief report about what we've been doing in the past months with, um, with my colleagues, Mehdi. So we hope that our study will contribute to a better understanding of Persian Twitter sphere and, um, and the current culture and discourses around sexual harassment, rape and feminist movements in today's Iran. So Me Too was initially born in line to encourage women to speak out about the sexual assault. Condemning sexual abuse and sexual harassment in this social movement made it the digital world and social media platforms. Social media users publicize allegations of sex crimes, mostly toward people who benefit from certain social, class, racial, gender, or political power in relation to others. Um, and... Uh, in relation to others who mostly are identified to be on the marginalized side of power dynamics in society. So Me Too in Iran among all, like among Persian speaking users on Twitter or other social media platforms is still a relatively young digital movement. Launched and appeared in August, 2020 for the first time, this young and rapidly growing social media born movement calls for urgent attention from cultural critics and scholars in new media and humanities who work in Iran and Iranian culture. In this work in progress, we gather and collect tweets containing hashtag me to Iran by employing the Tweepy, Tweepy library in Python, by applying topic modeling methodology, a contextual pattern for creating themed categories was found. Sentiment analysis and topic dispersion will also give many other scholars and us a better statistical picture of the reality of topic distribution, the user's approach to this activism, and the dominantly used vocabulary by Iranian users about sexual assault. You might ask why studying hashtag MeToo matters. Um, I think it matters because the culture around sexual assault still matters, because women's rights matter, because power dynamics matters in discussing sexual harassment. Also, as an online hashtag activism, the new field of media or social media studies in today's world, this interdisciplinary approach is needed to understand digital activism because it has such a pivotal role. It needs to be studies in relation of law, society, online platforms, and platformization, democracy of them, and platform culture, which is an inseparable part of our today's culture now. It's also necessary to study that for understanding the contemporary and future culture. We need to analyze and have an interdisciplinary approaches to social movements on social media in general and um, various cultural productions on it. 
Also, if in the past we had people going on the street and asking for the social demands in, in form of protests on the street, now, um, especially after Black Lives Matter and also after pandemic, we see that a lot of this sort of social demands are being practiced virtually online on social media. So if social media is a part of culture, performing on it matters, then the virtual embodiment of performance matters. The impact users have on social media, the influence of companies and how platforms shape the culture and users' behaviors and vice versa, and also the policies and economics behind it, they all matters. And the reason we wanted to study on, also it's important to have digital humanities approach to the narratives, to have some sort of numerical approach to it. And you might also wonder why we picked Iran. I think one of the main reason is that it's a new movement and it's shaping the contemporary culture right now as, as if we're speaking. The other reason is that hashtag me to an English speaking area has been studied by many scholars by now, but the relevant Persian content on Twitter seems to be still a bit understudied. It's also complicated to talk about sex as a cultural taboo and reporting it in a country with certain traditional and sociopolitical background like Iran. By this work, we specifically want to know, and I'm sorry for the noise, what are the words and meanings created by the public in the discourse of feminism during the hashtag MeToo Iran movement? What patterns emerge among hashtags in the hashtag MeToo movement? So for doing that, we started scraping the tweets like all the other similar research projects. And in scraping the tweets from this movement, we had one major problem. There are no official SMO or social movement organization registered in Iran that are working on Twitter on this. It can be said that unlike the English material on the movement in North America, which was a top button or a collective movement in which hashtags were offered and unified like regularly by some certain SMOs and were then actively used by user, users. In Iran's case, it's actually the other way around. This movement was mostly connective, meaning from bottom to top. So users and individuals in Twitter started actually creating it and leading it. This is what, why not all the materials on hashtag me in Iran can be found on the same label, meaning the same hashtag. There are many site movements that can fall into the category of hashtag me too, and they're actually vital parts of this movements. Hashtags such as Asad Wazi Begu, meaning tell me about your military service in which male users were talking about the sexual abuse they had um, when they were doing their compulsory military service in Iran, or Charagozarish Nadadam, hashtag Charagozarish Nadadam, meaning why I didn't report. Therefore, gathering hashtags such as Manham, which is the translated term of Me Too in Persian, did not necessarily lead us to relevant content. One account handled Me Too Iran was identified as an account that has been actively labeling the relevant content by hashtag Me Too Iran and retweeting the narratives. This account now receives the narratives and shares them on large scale. Its major activity is on Instagram by having around 90k followers at the moment. Although incomplete, we decided to focus on hashtag me to Iran in form of Latin alphabets that it has introduced by this account and start by scraping these tweets only. We preferred not to do topic modeling as we had about 2000 tweets from August 22 until February 2022. Therefore, because in topic modeling, like you expect to have more data. Therefore, we started the close reading procedure to detect some thematized categories. We acknowledge that many other ways of categorizing the data are possible and hereby we suggest categories below after going through the tweets containing the various forms of hashtag me to Iran as the following patterns appear. The categories are broad and the main aim was for them not to overlap. It's important to highlight that these tweets led us to subjective creation of these categories as if this pattern was emerged among them. So actually what we did was to close reading of around 1,000 tweets and try to decide um, which belongs to which categories. It was not an easy task to do, not because it was just close reading, because we had to go through some materials that were direct narratives about rape and sexual assault. So these are the five categories that we came up with. 
The first one is support. Any content that amplifies the voice is going to be under the support. Number two is victim blaming. Any sort of blaming or teasing the contents of sexual assault or narratives or expressing strong, dis strong disbelief in the narratives are counted in this category. Number three was educational or instructive content. Any educational content such as writing about historical roots of patriarchy, feminism, dynamics of power, and its relationship with sexual assault, the law and legal aspects of reporting sex crime in Iran or abroad are considered to be educational and instructive to the public and Twitter users. Number four were the narratives, the direct or indirect narratives of rape or sexual assault or sexual harassment. Number five was uncategorized. Anything that did not belong to the mentioned categories, we decide to label it as uncategorized. These are the numbers that we ended up with. Um, the explored pattern, so as you see, I'm gonna like show you, okay, so we have a visualization here. So as you see, we have like around one fourth of these tweets labeled as uncategorized, meaning that we were unable to categorize them. But if I remove that part and just have a look at the tweets that were actually find a way to the categories that we suggested, we see that 37.8% are supportive, 15% are victim blaming, which is a remarkable number. And then we have around one fourth that are educational and number four, around again, less than one fourth are narratives of sexual assault. The explored pattern in contextual themes of tweets with Me Too Iran, which are mostly in the Persian language, demonstrates that the Twitter platform has been relatively hostile to this movement and survivor narratives of sexual assault in Iran. A prominent category of these tweets was of educational and, inst and instructive content for the public about how to speak about sexual assault and for the survivors about how to report them. A remarkable proportion of tweets contained victim blaming and expressed strong opposition against this feminist wave and social activism. Around one fourth of these tweets, as I said, were not categorized. While focusing on category of narratives only, like getting only that one fourth of um, tweets that were only narratives, um, we identified the top repeated words as you see in this table. Among them, sexual, narrative, rape, harassment, and assault were predictable to be on this table as there are narratives of sexual assault. However, among the top repeated words, we found this. The word sokut, meaning silence, was among top repeated words in the narratives. It was repeatedly used by survivors in the narratives and on different contents. That might tell us something about the current culture around sexual assault in Iran. Eventually, these are some conclusions that I'm going to just like um, skip over them. We can conclude that there is no registered social official SMO for Me Too in Iran currently, and there are many side movements around narratives. However, handle me underline to underline Iran has labeled relevant tweets by an English hashtag called hashtag Me Too Iran. The word silence has been found to be the most repeated word among narratives and reports of sexual assaults, which can mean most of the survivors have mentioned this concept in some ways or another in their narratives. A list of occupations mentioned has been, found, has been found which shed light on the industries and working atmosphere most repeated while narrating the sexual assault. An example is that we had the word journalist repeated a lot during the narratives, which means the relationship between the abuser and the survivor was that the abuser, they both were journalists or it happened in news agency. There are further questions for us and for other scholars who are interested in um, continuing this work. For example, we're working on more word proximity methods, such as what are the emotion dis emotions discussed, the piece of clothing discussed, the body members mentioned in the narratives. More hashtags needs to be studied regardless of the SM SMO. What is the role of SMOs on Iranian social media? Has this activism been collectively or connectively moving forward? Can we use topic modeling in case we retrieve more tweets? If yes, how will the results be different or similar to ours? Did victim blaming tweets decrease in time or increase during this time? And how is the anti-feminist tweet sphere on Persian Twitter changing it, if it is? Our data, including the uncategorized tweets, around 25% of all tweets are available for public. It's encouraged for further research that these tweets, the 
that be explored and studied and other patterns or framing themes might be suggested and explored and found. Eventually, this study hopefully shed light well on some cultural aspects of feminism, and it aims to explore some potential existing questions and lead to raising more. Existing questions such as what the critics to the sex crime allegations or this specific digital activism are in an online platform such as Twitter will be analyzed. This work aims to raise questions such as why and how the online platforms hosting this movement matter, what they added or how they have contributed to activities and citizens from minor minoritized and often historically silenced backgrounds in discussing sexual abuse and power dynamics. I'm done and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Uh, um, I'm going to spotlight both you and Erin so that folks can see you um, and invite folks if you have any questions for either Erin or Yasmin to please um, drop them in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, Erin, um, I, had, I had a quick question for you about um, the word cloud stuff that you mentioned. Could you, could you kind of uh, go back to your presentation and um, elaborate a little bit. Yeah, I, I realized that I skipped over that part. I got a little out of order. So um, you, you can use word clouds in a lot of different ways. And there are lots of, I included on that symbol page, a lot of different word cloud generators. I usually use wordclouds.com. It's just my favorite go to. Um, but essentially what you can do is create a visualization that's based on frequency of words in a, in a given corpus. And um, I've used it in, um, especially in conversation classes when we were looking at literature or looking at a specific text, I created a word cloud and I would put it up on, in my presentation, like up on the screen and then have them discuss it and discuss those lexical items that um, show up more frequently or larger in the visualizations like here, this is from that same short story, La Tisica, and it created, it generated a lot of conversation between my students. Um, you can use it also uh, to have them, they can create their own word clouds and then um, discuss things with, with other students. You can use it to summarize work. It creates a word list for you with the frequency. So that's a nice kind of point of departure if you wanna go dive deeper and look at lexical items. Um, and then one thing I used it for in my conversation and composition class this semester was to have the students look at their composition skills. And I had them, we did a prompt where they wrote for like 10 minutes in class in Spanish. And then I had them take that um, piece of text and I had them put it in a word cloud generator and had them look at word frequency. And they found that many times they were using like the word thing, they were using very vague terms and we talked about word choice. Um, this is an example right here of actually an essay that I wrote. Um, and this is the word list that is generated from that. So they can then use that frequency. It's not limitized, so it's not 100% accurate. Um, it is accurate, but it could be honed down a little bit more. Like if you had the word work and works, those would should be delemmatized together if you were doing a computational analysis. Um, but it gives you a point of departure and it also, like I said, encourages group discussion. So that was the part about word clouds. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Erin. Um, yes, I mean, there's two questions for you in the chat. I'm going to read them both off. Um, the first question is from Andrea. Um, and they said, I know you opted for a close reading route, but were there Persian specific text mining tools available to you or was that an obstacle? Additionally, do you think that there might be a correlation between using the Me Too flag in the first place with the thematic distribution of the course? I ask because I wonder how much the tag itself generates signals a greater awareness of what happened in the original Me Too movement and what that says about the participants of this conversation. Um, do you want to answer that one first, then I'll read the second one? Or yeah, sure. That was sure. that's a good question. Like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Mehdi also agrees with me. So, yeah, the language was in in doing digital humanities or some sort of data work on Python and everything. Of course, language sometimes bothers because we're not working with with English alphabets as ingredients, and that that might like cause errors or stuff. But the methodology and algorithm is the same. Um, 
it's just like haven't been worked out more like as much as you know it has been worked out in english speaking material so i don't think that was um that was what the, the, the main problem for us to go with closed reading is that we only had 2000 tweets that after cleaning the data and removing the duplicates, they we had just like 800, 900 tweets. So that was actually the first and the main reason that we didn't go with other methods. But if we retrieve more data, definitely in future, we aim to try those too. And for the second part of the question, which is such a great question, of course, I think there is a correlation between using the Me Too tag in the first place with the thematic distribution. Like, as I said, those hashtags were not, were not being assigned to tweets by users, but it was used on those tweets from an account that it labels itself as official Me Too movement account. So, of course, when they were looking for materials, they they might have like you know because when you assign a hashtag to content and the way you search for it it will definitely affect the the, the categories that we found maybe if we were not looking at if with that method we we're not scraping methods with that method uh, things would have been different um this is my idea maybe my colleague has a different perspective on it thank you thank you yes i mean um I'm actually going to read the next two questions because they seem a little bit related. Um, the, the, um, the question from Anahita asks, oh, well, they say, yes, I mean, awesome work and such a great topic. Have you investigated the tweets in terms of the abuser or perpetrator's status? Um, for example, if they are family members, strangers, or famous scholars. And the second question is, have you seen, is uh, from Aho? And they ask, have you seen similar trends uh, following the hashtag on Instagram as on Twitter, or are there any discrepancies? And they say thank you. I'm going to start from the second question. We have not worked on Instagram, and I'm my assumption is that Instagram atmosphere about hashtag Me Too is quite wide and different compared to Twitter. So I have no say about Instagram and whatever that is going on about this movement on that platform. But as someone who worked on the material from Twitter, I can say that um, in response to the question that Anahita asked here is that we quite have, um, so working on the category that was um, made of the tweets that were from narratives, there were some jobs mentioned. So we, we, we were we made to find some jobs and occupation. And we speculate that those jobs and occupation are actually demonstrating the relation of the abuser with the survivors. And among them, as I can remember, journalist and writer and artist were among the top. So this doesn't mean that all the sexual assault that were reported or happened in Iran was not from family members or strangers, but it shows that this hashtag with the way we co collect the tweets and scrape them shows that um, that area and that occupations were among the abusers in our case study. I hope I, I answered your question, Anaida. Thank you. Yeah, 